Hi, and welcome to this video where we're going to be running through the main key features of OCR A-Level Biology Module 4.1, which is all about disease. Now, this unit is um, pretty complicated. Um, I'd really like to go into a lot of depth, but I think I'm going to have to restrain myself because um, we really don't know uh, fully how the immune system works. Uh, so this is something the scientists are really researching um, a lot at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of complexity and, and quite a bit of uncertainty about how, how interactions occur, but we're really just going to focus on the key points from the syllabus. Uh, and what I will do is I will link in a few animations and videos in the description below. Uh, so if you want to go a bit further into any one area, then you can uh, always open one of those links uh, and do so. So the first thing you need to do um, is get the images for the mind map. So you can either get this from uh, this sort of A3 printout, uh, for, um, which I'm just going to disappear for a second, so you can screen grab if you want. Or uh, you can get it from this A4 printout. Again, I'll disappear for a sec, so you can screen grab if you would like to. And then what you need to do is you need to print them out, cut them out, uh, and you're going to arrange them uh, on an A3 sheet of paper to do a mind map of this topic. Okay, so uh, if you need to do that now, get some colourful pens, pencils, we're going to do our mind map uh, and come back in a second, and we're going to get started. Okay, so first of all, let's look at pathogens. What are they? Pathogens is a microorganism that causes disease. Hopefully you knew that already, but let's get some key definitions down. So we're going to zoom into this area up here. Okay, pathogen. microorganism that causes disease. It's important to say that so many microorganisms are not pathogens, okay? You have billions upon billions, in fact, probably trillions of bacteria inside your intestine right now. They are not causing disease. They're helping you digest your food. Uh, and you also have bacteria in your skin, uh, everywhere really. Uh, and we kind of call this the microbiome, a community of microorganisms that kind of make up who we are. So not all microorganisms are pathogens. I really want to stress that. A lot of interesting research being done that in the middle uh, at the moment. Okay, so what are the main types of pathogens? Well, let's look at them. Okay, so we've got bacteria. We've got viruses. We've got fungi. And we've got protists. So this, this word sometimes is said in a lot of different ways. You can call it pro, okay, I'll, I'll write a few of them, okay? So we can call them the protists. That's how it's written sometimes. Or if you want to use the kind of Latin term, you can say that they belong to the protoctista. There's the group. Or even protozoans. So if you basically see prot, that's what this is, okay? All right, so bacteria, viruses, fungi, prot protists. All right, so how do they cause disease? Very basic, very brief here, okay? We're not going to go fully into the detailed structure of the bacteria because we should have already done that on the cells mind map. Hopefully you remember a few things. Maybe if we zoom in here, you can just sort of have a look at the structure there. Can you remember what some of those things point to? You can do that for yourself if you'd like it. Pause the video. Okay. Um, the main thing in terms of disease that we need to uh, remember is they cause disease by mainly producing toxins. Okay, so different bacteria have different toxins. For example, the bacteria cholera is um, a bacteria that causes basically really, really terrible diarrhea. Uh, and the cholera toxin is a protein that is responsible for causing this watery diarrhea because it, it basically interferes with I think it's chloride ion transport in cells in your lower intestine, okay? So it causes disease by producers of toxins. Um, they uh, reproduce. Can you remember how they reproduce? Is it mitosis? No, it's not. Uh, it's binary fission because they don't have a nucleus. So they're reduced by binary fission. And this can be up to uh, every 20 minutes. OK, if they're really in a happy place, putting in nutrients, bacteria can re re replicate every 20 minutes. So you go from 1 to 2 to 4 to 8 to 16 to 32 and so on. So you get large numbers, exponential growth 
very, very quickly. Okay, so that's mainly everything about uh, bacteria and how they cause disease. Now, uh, we need to know some examples, so let's list them uh, now. I'm just getting these uh, from the textbook, page 229. Um, but let's put them down. What color I'm going to go? I'm going to go a different color. Okay, so examples. You need to know these examples because they're in the syllabus about which ones, um, so what diseases are caused by what things. Okay, so first of all, tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, human disease, affects the lungs, can affect some other animals as well, like cattle, for example. Um, affects the lungs, caused by a bacterium called mycobacterium tuberculosis. Maybe we should write that down as well. Tuberculosis. Um, don't really know too much about these mycobacterium, but an interesting fact about them is that they're very, very tiny. They're really small, even for bacteria. Uh, and mycobacterium can actually go inside of cells. So normally we're thinking only viruses go inside of cells, but these mycobacterium can actually kind of hide inside cells as well, which is one of the reasons they're difficult to treat. So mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, and in the book here it also says M. bovis, so mycobacterium bovis is causes cattle um, to TB. Okay, so what else? Uh, we've got meningitis can be caused by bacteria. Doesn't have to be, you can also get viral meningitis. Meningitis is another one. Uh, so in plants, I'm gonna do green here. Okay, so in plants, ring rot is a plant disease. Um, just scanning down. Uh, yeah, that's those are the three main bacterial ones that you need to know of. Okay, so treatment, this image here is about the treatment. Uh, so antibiotics. They can treat bacteria. Only bacteria, okay? Antibiotics cannot be used to treat viruses or fungi or protists, generally speaking. There might be one or two exceptions, but no. Antibiotics are designed to work against uh, bacteria. And this image here shows um, uh, a way of assessing what antibiotics will work on a bacteria. So um, this is, I'll just describe what's going on here. So bacteria, cultured on a plate, agar plate that is, not just like a dish plate. Um, and this area, these areas here, these clear areas, is called the zone of inhibition. Clear area equals zone of inhibition. I'll just write inhib for short, okay? And that's where the bacteria either cannot grow or are killed by the antibiotic. So you can see that some uh, antibiotics are more effective than others. For example, it would appear like, you know, these ones are effective at combating whatever bacteria is growing on this plate, and the yellow one here not, is not, not good, not effective. Potentially, we have resistance there, okay? So, um, where am I gonna put this? Okay, so resistance, resistance is a big problem, okay? It's a big problem. Essentially, it's called by, it's basically a natural selection type of thing that's happening. So when you use antibiotics, the more resistant or the more tough bacteria that can kind of stand the antibiotic treatment, they uh, they go on to reproduce, they survive, they pass on genes for resistance, and resistance develops over time. The more we use antibiotics, the more bacteria become resistant. Um, things like using half a course of antibiotics and then stopping, that is a really bad thing to do because it encourages resistance because it means that um, you, you might not have killed all the bacteria that are making you sick. If you take half the course and then you stop, then the ones that are slightly more capable of standing that, antib that antibiotic could be spread onto other people or to other places and that could cause increased resistance in the bacteria themselves, okay? All right, I will link in one of my favorite, um, 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 not animations, experiments showing the growth of antibiotic resistance below, okay? I think it's a nature video one. I'll show that below in the description. So look at that now if you'd like to see that. Okay, viruses. 
Now, viruses, they cause disease by getting into cells, okay? They, let's say they take over cells and plus reproduce inside of them. So they're not really alive, okay? So they're not, there's kind of a disagreement about whether they're actually alive or not. They're not they don't do anything when they're not infecting a cell. So this is pretty blurry here. You probably can't tell what's going on. So let's label, this is the capsid, okay? Protein coat. Now, some viruses just have in here a uh, nucleic acid. So viruses could be RNA, for example, coronavirus and flu, or DNA. Uh, for example, I think m most of them are DNA viruses. I think measles is a DNA virus. Um, HIV is also a um, RNA virus. Okay, so we have nucleic acid of some form containing the code, the information inside a capsid, which is a protein code. Not all viruses have an extra lipid membrane around the outside, but some do. Okay, so this is a lipid envelope. Sorry, lipid, not envelope, lipid membrane. And typically that lipid membrane comes from the cell that they've come out of. So viruses go into a cell, they reproduce, and when the viruses exit the cell, they take a little bit of the cell surface membrane with them, and that becomes their lipid membrane. This is why um, hand washing is so effective against coronavirus, because uh, detergent breaks down lipid or, or disrupts the forces that hold the membrane together. So soap destroys the lipid membrane, rendering the viral particle um, non-functional. Non okay, it doesn't really kill it because it's not alive, but it means the viral particle cannot infect as uh, well at all. Now, there may also be proteins on the, on the surface that help it do its thing. So there will be um, proteins, and typically the proteins on the surface would be used by the virus to get into cells. So, for example, in the coronavirus, um, the protein, I forget what it's called, but it, it binds to the receptor ACE1, or is it ACE2? An ACE receptor in the cells of a, a human to get in, okay? Okay, that is everything about viruses. Now let's look at some examples. I'm going to put a little uh, link below again. If you want to see this process of viral replication, have a look below uh, in the video. There are different types of viral replication. Some um, sort of need to get into the nucleus of the cell for them to take over the machinery and replicate. Some viruses actually insert the DNA into our own genomes. Those are called retroviruses, like DNA. Uh, some viruses need to be, uh, can only infect sort of actively growing cells, and you know, there's a lot of diversity there, but basically they have to get into the cell, and I'll show you the video underneath in the description. All right, examples. Okay, we've got HIV. HIV AIDS, uh, and let's just put that as a retrovirus. So that actually does insert its DNA into the nucleus, which is why it's so difficult to treat. Because even if you've destroyed all the viral particles in the body, then the, the DNA, which is hiding in the sort of nucleus, can reactivate and make more viral particles. Uh, flu. Flu viruses. Um, tobacco mosaic. Well, always, let's put coronavirus, obviously. Okay, that's an obvious example. Um, plant example. Tobacco mosaic virus. Uh, what else have we got? Those are the ones that you need to know. Those are the ones you need to know. Okay. All right. So now we move on to fungi. So fungi grow uh, in a really interesting way. Um, and I'm going to show you an animation uh, now, I'll pop it in, um, which is going to show you how fungi grow. So fungi we know as is mold. Uh, you can see, hopefully here, that this sort of mold is growing out in a sort of circular fashion. And what's actually occurring when that's happening is hyphae are extending. So hyphae are long sort of tube-like structures that are really just 
cell growing, but the, the hyphae, the, the end walls of the cells kind of fuse, so instead of multiple cells, it becomes kind of a tube structure. And those, stru those tube structures grow outwards like that. Now, when they grow outwards like that, they release enzymes, extracellular enzymes that go out into the surroundings, digest what's around, and then the hyphae absorb back um, the nutrients they need. So this is, you know, in, in um, decomposing sort of dead stuff out, you know, like leaves on the ground, this is called saprotrophic nutrition and it helps recycle nutrients. But if a fungi is trying to do this in a living body, then it causes harm. So that's how fungi cause disease and cause harm is mainly through the action of the enzymes that are kind of breaking down the tissue. Um, so let's add um, some notes. Okay, so fungi, um, so we've got, uh, so hyphae are kind of like the tubes, sort of, uh, and when we have many hyphae, it's called the mycelium. Uh, I'm kind of running out of space, I'm going to move over here. So they release extracellular enzymes that digest stuff, okay? Uh, and I'll just put, we don't really say saprotrophic nutrition when we're talking about um, inner body, but I'll just put that there because it, it kind of links into other things. So saprotrophic nutrition is what happens when we're talking about decomposers like dead leaves, dead wood, that sort of stuff. But it's, it's, we just don't really say saprotrophic nutrition when it's in a body, but it's basically the same thing. Okay, um, protist, protoctista. Oh, sorry, examples, we forgot about examples. The main one, athlete's foot. Uh, and then we've got a few fungal diseases. Um, oh, we've also got ringworm, both in humans and in cattle. Um, and another fungal one for plants, hence the green, is something called black cigatoka. Cigatoka. And you may remember when we were looking at um, evolution and um, sort of monocultures and things like that, we talked about bananas um, and um, the Panama disease, I think, is also a fungal disease that affects bananas that is potentially going to wipe out um, our most popular banana, which is the Cavendish banana currently. All right. OK, so protist, protoctista. These are, remember, like sort of these are eukaryotes. So that's that's important. So are fungi as well. But these are eukaryotic, quite complicated, generally single-celled organisms. So they can be quite difficult to treat because some of them have quite complex mechanisms. For example, the malarial parasite um, and some other parasites such as sleeping sickness parasite, which are pro protists. protists what they do is they basically constantly, when they're in your body, they every week or so, all the proteins kind of change their external coat. So they change the proteins on their coat, and then they wait another week or two, and then they change it again, which now enables it to kind of stay one step ahead of any antibodies that your body is trying to make. So quite crafty. Um, so in terms of how they cause harm, um, they normally enter host cells. Um, and maybe feeding on the contents as they grow. So that is um, what the malarial parasite does. It goes into the red blood cells and it feeds on the hemoglobin. Uh, so examples, malaria. Um, what else? Blight, okay, so this is a plant one. Potato, potato, 
uh, or tomato blight. So just blight for short. Potato or tomato blight is caused by a protoctista. Uh, other things like sleeping sickness uh, is another human one that is caused uh, by this as well. Sorry about that. Trypanosomiasis uh, is another one. Okay, so that is everything about um, the types of pathogens and some of the examples that are uh, on the syllabus that you need to know. All right, so if you want to um, pause there and add some more information, either from your textbook or your own research, then please do. And if not, we are going to move on and talk about how pathogens can be transmitted. Okay, so now we're going to move across and look at transmission of pathogens. Now, clearly, this is a very topical area, right? We're in the middle of a um, viral pandemic. Uh, so we're really, really concerned with trying to reduce the transmission. And this is what social distancing is all about. So um, transmission is a key word. Uh, and that just means um, passing uh, a pathogen from person to person. So, so this up here is called waves of transmission. And actually, these images really um, show um, what you need to know. Uh, okay, so direct contact, person to person, transmission of a disease, exchange of fluids. So this could be uh, through sexual intercourse or things like uh, blood transfusions. So actually, let's put, uh, put um, a few little notes underneath. So, okay, we could be talking about sexually transmitted. We be, could be talking about blood transfusions. A lot of people in the 80s, I believe, picked up HIV through blood transfusions because the virus was poorly understood. Um, and I think it was a lot of people who had haemophilia and received regular blood transfusions got HIV in this unfortunate way. Also needles, things like that. Yeah. Um, contamination. Okay, so this is, um, we could say this slightly different um, in the textbook. So let's change this. So we call it fecal oral transmission. Okay. Fecal oral transmission. That basically means, this is a bit gross, poo, mouth. Okay, so that's not very nice, is it? So if fecal material somehow ends up in food or drink, then that can cause contamination um, of the food or drink, and then that causes spread of the, of the pathogen. For example, cholera. Okay, so cholera, I talked about earlier, cholera toxin causes lots of very watery diarrhea to be produced by um, uh, infected individuals. And if this watery diarrhea gets into a water stream, uh, or river flows downstream. Someone goes to take water uh, from that river. Maybe it looks all right, but there might be cholera bacteria in that river, and then it's passed on. Okay, so airborne. Now there's actually a few different types of airborne transmission. So let's sort of let's go into that. Uh, okay, so airborne can be droplet infection. So droplet infection is actually there is a distinction between droplet infection and sort of truly airborne. Okay, so droplet infection just means if you sneeze or cough, tiny little particles of saliva containing the virus can travel. Now, with coronavirus, the particles, uh, we've studied the particles, there's a lot of research still being done. So none of this is certain, but um, the advice from the government is that two meters is a, is a distance that is large enough because the particles containing coronavirus are quite large and tend to be heavy and fall to the ground within about two meters um, in front of someone. It is different when people sneeze, so sneezing can propel the particles further. I think it was up to five meters. Um, that's why covering your mouth when you're sneezing is extremely important. Okay, So droplet infection, little droplets, coronavirus. If something is truly airborne, um, then it can remain in the air for a lot longer and travel a lot further. Um, so for example, uh, for example, e.g. some bacteria and viruses produce spores, which are very sort of tough 
durable versions of the pathogen that can last for a long time, uh, can, be, can be carried in the air, and can even um, remain viable in soil for many, many years in the case of something like anthrax. So vectors, a vector is an example of indirect transmission, okay? So when there needs to be some thing that helps the uh, disease spread. And a very good example of that is malaria, where the vector is the mosquito. Okay, um, so examples of these, uh, oh, let's keep my purple for examples. Uh, okay, direct contact. Okay, we're, we're going to say meningitis, ringworm, ath, foot. Okay, athlete's foot. Exchange of fluids, typical one, HIV. Um, things like that. Okay, fecal oral transmission, we said cholera. Food poisoning, a lot of food poisoning is, is sort of uh, is this way. I'm kind of running out of space, let's go down here. Food poisoning. Uh, airborne, well, okay, we sort of talked about, so droplet infection is corona. Truly airborne, I'm not too sure. Uh, let me find an example. So found the example, uh, so for example, um, measles, this is not one with spores, I don't think. Spores, an example, is anthrax. Uh, and the spores can live in soil. Well, they don't live because they're kind of they're kind of dormant, but they can survive in soil for many years actually for in the anthrax. Measles, we talk about R number. Okay, so that what is the typically this is a bit of a diversion, but it's topical, okay? So R, what is that? Okay. R is at when there is a, a population that is not immune to this virus at all, what is the um, typical value? So if one person is infected, how many people do then they go on to infect on average? Okay. So with the coronavirus, it's around three. Uh, with measles here, it's actually about 14. Measles is one of the most infectious viruses that we know of because it's truly airborne. And one person with measles, on average, will infect 14 other people if they haven't been vaccinated. Okay, this is why measles outbreaks are such a serious thing. Uh, doesn't seem like a big a deal right now, but people need to maintain their vaccinations, otherwise measles epidemics become more and more common. So R is the rate of transmission. And if you've been following the coronavirus news, um, you might have heard of R naught. This is initially when no one is immune uh, and when, you know, just at the beginning of the epidemic, um, it's kind of the natural rate of replication of the virus. And then we have the R value, which is not, which is the sort of, um, as the epidemic progresses and more people have become immune or social distancing measures are taking place, what is the R value currently? So currently we're still at an R value below one, which has been brought down from the R naught, the high R naught of around about three. And now hopefully we're staying below um, an R of one. Okay, so those are some ways of transmission. Um, all right, so we're going to look at briefly um, a animation of the malaria life cycle now, and then we're going to make a bit of notes over here. Now, this is quite complicated. You don't need to know the full, full picture, but let's investigate a little bit. Okay, so here we have um, a female mosquito. It's only the pregnant female Anopheles mosquito that feeds on blood. Feeding on the blood. And here we can see her proboscis inserted into the capillaries there. Now, when she injects the proboscis in, she also injects some saliva. Now, saliva contains anticoagulants, but also this saliva contains malarial parasites. So um, what they do is they get into the blood flow uh, and they follow the flow of blood. They ride the, the flow of blood to their first target, which here is the liver. So the malarial parasites go in and infect the liver cells as the first stage of their life cycle. We learn about the liver structure um, a little bit more in year 13, so this is kind of relevant. 
all these tubes here. Very good blood flow in the liver cells and the hepatocytes are these uh, liver cells that are infected. I'm going to stop that there. If you want to continue, then um, you should watch this uh, video. I'll put the link uh, below in full. Okay, so what do we really need to know here? Um, in terms of this diagram, we need to know that the, the life cycle is complicated. Um, part of the malarial parasite life cycle happens in the mosquito and part of it happens in the human body. Now, uh, the greater level of detail that you could sort of understand if you want is that in, in the human body, there's actually different phases. The first part is in the liver. Uh, so that's kind of the liver part. And the second part is inside the blood cell, okay, this part. Uh, blood, sorry. So, so periodically, basically, what happens is the, the kind of the um, plasmodium parasite goes into the liver cell, replicates inside the liver cell, then it explodes out uh, and it goes off to try and colonize blood cells. Um, when the, the parasites sort of explode out of the liver cells, this causes fever, but then when they sort of go and hide in the red blood cells, the body kind of loses track of the parasites, and then they go and replicate in the blood cells, and then they pop out again, and then that causes fever. So malaria also quite often causes waves of fever that seem to come and go and come and go. Um, the different types of malarial parasites, uh, this one is the main one, Plasmodium falciparium. Um, there it is, Plasmodium falciparium. There are a few others, uh, I forget them all. One of them is called Plasmodium vivax, and I think the other one is called Plasmodium ovalis or something like that. So it's like three or four different closely related organisms that cause malaria. Uh, okay, so what about the mosquito? So once these um, parasites have kind of burst out of the red blood cells, they actually form gametes. Uh, so this bit right here, I don't know if you can see that, I'll highlight in blue. Uh, again, you don't need to know the full detail here, but that's actually the gametes there. Oops, too big. Um, and the gametes are then taken up by another mosquito that feeds on this infected human. So, and it's then actually the gametes then get together pretty much in the saliva glands of the mosquito and then new uh, parasites are injected into another person. So the key thing here is this is a vector born disease. So touching on all these routes of transmission, both indirect with vectors and direct means of transmission, is the impact of climate. So just be aware that climate can affect transmission um, because bacteria and fungi can replicate more efficiently in, in warmer temperatures. Uh, and also, for example, mosquitoes only live uh, where uh, the climate is sufficiently warm uh, and when there's there's lots of lots, there's standing water is around where mosquitoes can breed because they actually need water to lay their eggs mosquitoes so people many people think that climate change may make diseases many human diseases more prevalent in more parts of the world as the earth's climate warms so that was um, everything about transmission of the virus uh, sorry of pathogens what about defense? Okay, that's the second part of this whole thing. And we, we've actually sp spoke for, I've spoke for quite a long time, so I'm gonna try and speed up here. First, we're gonna look at plant defenses. Okay, so, right, we've got, and I'm gonna do this fairly briefly. If you wanna go into more detail, look at page 232 and 232 of your book. So we've got passive, physical, Defenses, the kind of the outer barrier. And we we've got things like, let's actually make a list. Cellulose, that's tough, protects cells. We've got waxy cuticles, that's tough, it's impermeable, it protects the outside of the leaf. We've got bark, that's pretty good on a tree trunk, prevents um, any pathogens going in. Um, we've also got stomatal, Closing, okay, so Tomata can close. Sometimes if they detect the presence of a pathogen, they might close. Um, and the two things which are kind of maybe a bit more important here, I think are callos 
And this is a protein that blocks the phloem. Okay, so if a pathogen does get into the plant, quite often pathogens move in plants through the vascular tissue. We looked at that in the last mind map, xylem and phloem. So callose blocks the phloem, and there's uh, another molecule called tylose that blocks the xylem if infection is detected. So that callose blocks the sieve plates. I'll just write SP blocks the sieve plates. Uh, and the tylose, I think, blocks the whole xylem vessel. Okay, so there's passive physical defenses. There's also chemical defenses. that can also be sort of scaled up. So if an if a attack is detected by the plant, then there are various plant signaling mechanisms involving plant hormones that can cause the production of chemicals to defend the plant. So really, I think we just need to know some of the names of these. We've got terpenes, terpenoids. This is the kind of, um, I think examples of terpenes are things like um, menthols uh, and piney scents that you get in certain plants. These are terpene oils. We get phenols. Um, examples of this uh, are tannins and polyphenols. So tannins like uh, are found in tea, for example. So phenols might be found in tea leaves. You've got alkaloids, alkaloids. Um, Chemicals that are alkaloids, quite, quite a lot of drugs are alkaloids. Um, for example, caffeine, nicotine, cocaine, those are all alkaloid chemicals produced by plants for defense. Um, then we've got things called defensins. And I'm running out of space here, hydrolytic enzymes. Hydrolysis, remember, is breaking down, so hydrolytic enzymes things that can break down, I'm just going to put a little barrier here, uh, can break down uh, pathogens once they have gone into the cell, so potentially breaking down fungal pathogens that are growing, trying to grow through uh, the plant roots or the leaves, for example. Okay, so that's plant defences. That was quite brief. If you want to add more detail, pause the video now, um, expand on some of these ideas. If not, we're going to move on down to human defences, which is all over here. OK, um, right, so now we're going to look at the human defences to uh, pathogens. And we can divide these defences up into primary defences and secondary defences. Now, actually, I've realised that I don't like where this primary defences word is over here, so I'm going to just rub it out. I'm going to move it uh, over here. A primary defenses. And then over here, we're going to look at secondary defenses. Okay, the reason we've done that is because primary defenses, uh, the definition is those that prevent pathogens that en entering the body. Prevent pathogens entering the body. Okay, we've got so many different uh, primary defenses. So let's do a kind of little list of them. I'm gonna go to green, okay? So right, we've got skin. Skin is impermeable. There's a protein called keratin in the skin that gives it its sort of impermeable uh, layer. Uh, the, the, they're produced by a cell called keratinocyte. And that's the main barrier to infection. Your skin protects you from having uh, pathogens getting into your body. Now, of course, the skin can be cut. So we have uh, a clotting response. So if we get a cut in our skin, we get a clotting response. Now, this diagram here is pretty uh, blurry, I realise. It is on page 235. Um, of your book. Okay, so I'm going to do a little bit of sort of key points here. Okay, so we have stuff like um, collagen, 
exposed. So normally collagen is kind of packaged away, and if there's damage to the cell, uh, to the cells of the tissue, collagen is exposed. It comes into contact with blood. And this starts a enzyme cascade. We also have platelets that can detect this collagen. And then all throughout this process, um, which I'm just kind of going to very sort of loosely show an arrow, which shows the sort of general flow of the process. All throughout this process, we call it an enzyme cascade or a clotting cascade. So I'll try and write this um, here. Again, there's some good videos of this. I'll put a link in the description to a clotting video showing the action of platelets and all these uh, activation events. But what I mean by an enzyme cascade is that one molecule of an enzyme is turned on, okay, activated. That one molecule of enzyme can then process and, and catalyze the formation of, you know, let's say hundreds or thousands of new molecules, new enzymes, that then can then activate millions of new enzymes, which then can activate billions of more enzymes. So we have an amplification from just a few collagen fibers exposed. Um, we get many, many amplification steps. And the end result is that we get, and this probably you do need to know, we have something called fibrinogen. Whoops. Uh, yeah, there we go. Fibrinogen is converted into fibrin. This is one of those kind of types of words that you should kind of be familiar with. So normally if you see in biology, what am I going to highlight this bit? Ogen. Okay, if you see ogen on the end of a word, normally that means it is an inactive form of a protein. And then when we cut off the ogen part of it, it is this sort of active form of the protein. So fibrinogen, is an inactive form of this protein which is constantly circulating in your blood, but if it gets the right signals, it will clot and form this net of fibrin. So actually a clot, what does this clot look like? Well, um, it's gonna have, I'm gonna try and draw this, it's gonna have a weavy network of fibrin fibers. This is the fibrin fibers all over the place. Fibrin, I'm going to keep the color code. Then we've got some um, bigger red blood cells stuck in that clot. And we've got little, what color are they going to be? Mm, orange. Little platelets. Now, platelets are little kind of fragments of cells, and actually, I'm going to reduce the size of it because they have kind of slightly star-shaped, so they help lock things together. Little platelet fragments. Now, actually, they should be way smaller than my RBCs. This is not ideally to scale, but those would be the platelets. Okay. If you want to go into more detail about that, watch the video in the link. So, clotting is also a primary defense because it stops. Uh, pathogens from getting into the body. Now, in many places, we can't help but having pathogens coming into contact. Whenever you in in inhale, hopefully you're indoors in a safe, you know, clean place, but you've still inhaled, sorry to say, hundreds of thousands of little bacteria and fungal particles and all that sort of stuff that, if it wasn't for mucous membranes, they could potentially kill you. But we're very well protected by mucous membranes. So let's look at this one underneath. Um, mucus, sometimes I find this difficult to spell, mucus membrane. So where are these? Uh, well, they are exchange surfaces. So the two main ones are in the lungs and digestive system. Okay, uh, and let's label these parts. This diagram again is on page 235 of your book. I'm gonna zoom in a little more. Uh, okay, so let's, first of all, we got mucus. Now the mucus is produced by goblet cells. Okay, so here is a gland. Uh, okay, I'm not gonna, no, oh, yes, okay. So this is, a, I'll just write gland over this. Maybe you can see it in the writing there. It says mucus secreting gland. And all of these cells here 
are, um, I think, are goblet cells that secrete mucus. And then we also have these goblet cells up here, this one, that secrete uh, more mucus. So goblet cells, they make the mucus, plus these specialized glands containing many mucus-producing cells that make even more mucus. And then we have these red cells, or ciliated epithelial cells, okay? Now, I just read uh, some really inter interesting information about this the other day. I'm reading a book called The Body by Bill Bryson. I highly, highly recommend it. It's a great book to read, maybe over the summer holidays. It's got loads of links to the A-level cell list, loads and loads and loads. Uh, and it told me the number of times a second that these ciliated epithelial cells beat, and I've forgotten what it is, I, but I think it's like 11 or 12 times a second. I kind of always imagined them kind of being quite casual about it, but they really move really fast to sweep up any bacteria that have been trapped in the mucus to sweep it up and out of the lungs. So the ciliated cells in your lungs, they sweep up the bacteria to your throat where you swallow them, and then they go into the stomach acid and it destroys them. So here is bacteria trapped in mucus. Now on the mucus membranes there's some other stuff which we don't really need to go into full detail about, but there are also, um, there are also macrophages, which are white blood cells that patrol the surface of those mucus membranes inside the lungs. Uh, this is kind of slightly extra detail so I'll just write extra so extra detail we have patrolling macrophages uh, and we have also um, underneath here underneath the mucous membrane we have good blood supply obviously for the exchange we need the good blood supply but we also have a lot of immune surveillance, so lots of cells constantly kind of watching to see if any new infection is coming in so that a response can be generated, a secondary response can be generated quickly. Um, so I'll write good blood supply plus immune surveillance. Uh, and I just read an article the other day about they found a new type of immune cell lymphocyte that is involved in the digestive system um, mucous membrane that is responsible for that surveillance, but I've forgotten the name, but it's just quite new, quite new research. Okay, other primary defenses, um, just quickly, we can talk about from key stage three, hopefully you remember, stuff like earwax, okay, that's a defense. Tears. Tears contain an enzyme called lysozyme, which digests bacteria, it pops their cell wall. Earwax, tears, and we've got stomach acid. Stuff like that are some other uh, things. Also, another primary defense as well can be used against us um, is, and I'm going to link it sort of off of here, is coughing and sneezing. So there are mechanisms in the lung that if we inhale particles and it irritates the mucous membrane, it can trigger coughing and sneezing to try and just eject particles out of the lungs. Okay, so now we move on to uh, secondary defenses. And there's kind of a slight bridge here between primary and secondary offenses, which is um, inflammation. Now in the textbook, it's, it says that this is a primary defense, although I sort of disagree because inflammation, well, it can be, it can be uh, in response to a pathogen getting in the body. So it's kind of a link between primary defenses and secondary offenses. So I'm gonna, that's where I'm gonna put it. Um, I'm gonna use, uh, change the color I'm gonna use purple okay so where I'm gonna kind of go like this inflammation so inflammation is diverting blood flow to an area which uh, is infected or damaged um, so it might not be damaged too badly. I mean, I'm not going to hurt myself very much, but if I was to just scratch myself on my hand like that, scratchy, um, what's going to happen is it's going to start to go red. Um, it's going to start to go red because I've probably damaged some collagen fibers in there. This is released signals. 
um, in that local area, which are causing more blood flow to the area. So it might cause vasodilation. Um, so that's just something to add here, vasodilation. It's also going to cause a certain type of white blood cell called a neutrophil to move to that area. So the neutrophils are constantly in the blood, um, the capillaries and the blood vessels. But if they sense damage, they kind of exit the capillary and go have a look around in the tissue to see what's up. So that's another thing. Um, neutrophils uh, move into the tissue. To go have a look. So that's the main stuff about inflammation. One of the signaling molecules that mediates this is histamine. Okay, so inflammation brings more blood, more white blood cells to the body, and that's really where we can start to look at secondary defenses. All right, so the main uh, secondary defense is phagocytosis, okay? Okay, now there's two different types of phagocytes, that cells that do this. We've got the neutrophils. And the neutrophils, uh, as I said, they live in the blood and then they kind of move out into the tissue when they're um, necessary. They have a multi-lobed nucleus. Uh, so here, let's just label that. Multi-lobed nucleus and one of the reasons that they have a multi node nucleus is because it enables them to squeeze through tight spaces so they can kind of squeeze out uh, other capillary into the tissue to go have a look so that's how that multi node nucleus helps them uh, and they're one of the most common phag phagocytes uh, and they are produced in the bone marrow i believe yep and they contain a lot lots and lots of lysozymes as well so let's label that lots of lysosomes okay um, also there are macrophages so macrophages are more kind of cells that are on patrol they tend to live in the tissues and they stay there patrolling around looking for invaders so if you were talking about I guess macrophages would be like um, like a patrolling police officer and a neutrophil would be more of um, like a SWAT team, like a rapid response team or something that would be called in. Uh, okay, so how does phagocytosis work? We kind of labeled this already. Um, so the first thing is that the neutrophil binds to something on the pathogen surface that identifies it as a pathogen. So that is the pathogen there. And now, how does it bind? Because you might say, how does it bind if it doesn't have any antibodies on it? How does the white blood cell know it's bad? Well, it could have already been, um, so let's just say binding, either uh, due to antibodies, which we're going to look at over here. This is an antibody. Or there are, there are also signals that, white blood cells can recognize as this is a bacteria. So we don't really need to know the details of that, but in, in, in sort of uni, we talk about PAMP. This is a uni level term. So PAMP stands for pathogen associated molecular particles or pathways, I think it is. Um, so sort of molecules such as peptidoglycan, that is a molecule that is not present in human cells, but is only present in bacterial cells, uh, I think another one is called lipopolysaccharides. So there are certain chemical molecules that white blood cells like, hey, we don't have that, only bacteria have that, we must eat that thing. Uh, okay, so now we get engulfing in the second picture. Uh, I'm just gonna kind of write it quite shorthand, engulfing uh, in this specialized uh, phagosome. So this here, that is called a phagosome that's forming. Now look at what's happening here. If you can see in detail here, all the lysosomes, these little arrows, are pouring out their digestive enzymes into the phagosome, so they kind of fuse with it. So the lysosomes fuse with the phagosome. Uh, lysosomes fuse with phagosome. Sometimes it's called a phagolysosome, 
uh, once it's fused. And then basically these, these enzymes digest the, the pathogen until it's just amino acids and sugars and you know just nutrient soup. And then it's all the good stuff, the, the nutrients are absorbed into the cell. Okay, so, uh, so small molecules, because it's now digested, are absorbed. So that's phagocytosis, which is a major, major secondary defense. Um, so now let's label these guys up here. So what we've got over here is a typical blood smear. You need to be able to recognize these cells. Hopefully you can. So this thing here, multi-lobe nucleus, what is it? Yep, yeah, that's a neutrophil. These guys, biconcave shape. What are they? They're red blood cells or erythrocytes. This thing here, this is a lymphocyte. Lymphocytes, um, the way you recognize those is that the nucleus, which is the large purpley thing, takes up almost all the volume of the cell. It's really, really large. And then the uh, monocytes, which is another word for macrophage, sort of, is this one. The reason I say sort of is actually because the monocytes are like the macrophages that are in the blood. But once they exit into the tissues, they, they change shape a little bit and become a bit more big and crawly aroundy. And then we call them macrophages. So actually monocytes turn into macrophages, but that's a bit beyond what you need to know. Okay. Now we move from the secondary defenses that are non-specific. Okay, so there's actually two types. Non specific to specific so the non-specific secondary defenses are things that will happen whatever the whatever's going on so you know phagocytosis is a non-specific defense inflammation is also non-specific but specific is tailored to the pathogen response is tailored to the pathogen. And a very, very important thing that occurs to make the nonspecific become specific is antigen presentation uh, along the way. So this means that phagocytes that have gone and investigated whatever's going on, they when they chop up the pathogen, they kind of retain small pieces of the antigens that they found on the surface of those pathogens, and they go and present them to other cells. So then we have what's called the specific immune response. Now this diagram up here shows a little bit of the specific immune response. Now you've got this diagram on page 240 of your book. Um, but we're going to quickly go through it, okay? So here's the antigen. I'm going to write on top because it's a bit blurry, and this is on the pathogen. Okay, so three things that can happen to it. A macrophage can eat it. So let's say this is a virus. So if the macrophage eats it, eats it, oops, um, it kind of will then present, can you see that these little arrows are now presented on the surface? So this is, um, antigens are presented on the surface. And then basically the macrophage travels into the uh, lymph nodes so the macrophage then travels to the lymph nodes where it shows the antigens that it's kind of found to a wide range of cells. Loads, thousands, millions of cells, and only the cells that can recognize that antigen then go on to divide, to divide and be activated. That whole process is called clonal selection. That's what it says here, okay? Very, very important.
That clonal selection leads very quickly to clonal expansion. Okay, if if a uh, immune cell like a T or T lymphocyte or B lymphocyte um, recognizes the antigen presented by the macrophage, it becomes active and it divides to produce millions of copies of it. So that's that's this proliferation. Cl clonal expansion is what proliferation is going on here. Uh, so we have multiple, multiple, multiple copies. Now that can happen with two different types of cell. That can happen with T helper cells or T killer cells. TK or TH cells. Um, all right, so they go on to proliferate. Uh, and then down the bottom here, if we get lots of T killer cells activated. So this is in your book here, T killer um, attack infected cells or we can have um, T helper cells this is a T helper cell can go on to help this response over here which is um, B lymphocyte activation So this can also be turned on, so if, if um, a cell becomes infected with a little virus, I'm going to draw a little virus inside of it, okay? All cells in the body, they naturally just show a little bit of what's going on inside on their surface. They present the antigens. So these are the antigens on the surface here. And again, if, it by, if this B cell has the right receptor on its surface to sort of to interact with this antigen, it can then divide and be turned into an active B cell, which then differentiates either into a plasma cell, which is really just an antibody factory, or a B memory cell. We can also have uh, T memory cells as well. Sorry, that's this one. T memory cells and this is T helper activates B cells. This is pretty complicated, this kind of web here. Um, so basically there's the, the body has to make a choice. It kind of has to decide what's going to be the most effective strategy. Um, do we need to produce more antibodies or do we need to produce more T killer cells? So T killer cells, just a little bit more on what they do, they will touch an infected cell and trigger apoptosis. Okay, we learn more about apoptosis in year 13. It is cell death, programmed cell death, sometimes called cell suicide. So it causes the cell to basically say, look, I'm infected with virus, I've got to take myself out for the team uh, and it will carefully digest itself, um, including the virus particles within. Uh, it actually does that. Um, it has this, it has some cool names, which I've kind of forgotten, but it has, this T killer cell has this thing called, um, I think it's called the death ligand. Yeah, I think it's that, death ligand. And it prods the cell with the death ligand, um, which then kills it, basically. That's why they're called T killer cells. Uh, all right, and there's a lot of um, cell signaling going on within that process. So one of the signaling molecules uh, kind of down here is monokines and interleukins are cell signaling molecules. We also have cytokines as well that um, are released by T helper cells. So T helper cells, gosh, uh, release cytokines, which kind of stimulate the other components of the immune system. Um, sometimes we can get too much cytokines. So coronavirus can be 
fatal because it causes so much cytokine release that it leads to something called a cytokine storm, which bases your immune system working just over overactive in the lungs, and that can cause fluid to build up in the lungs, which is the cause of pneumonia. Okay, so that's a cytokine storm. Super complicated. Um, I really, really recommend watching the video, uh, the Kurzgesagt video, um, which I will link below, which kind of shows this whole response, how a, a kind of cut leads to a primary, um, sorry, sorry, a non-specific response, and then that leads on to a more specific tailored response. Okay, so watch that video now, or pause and review that in your book, and now we're going to move on just to the very last part, which is really antibodies and vaccination. Okay, last little bit down here, I reckon I can keep it to 10 minutes. Antibodies, okay, so antibodies are a very uh, key part of the specific immune response. Okay, so this is specific, these antibodies, they're produced by plasma cells. Plasma cells are super, super active. They are just churning out antibodies as fast as possible, uh, you know, thousands per second. Um, they've got loads and loads of ribosomes because antibodies are proteins. So uh, let's look at the structure of an antibody. So first of all, uh, this top bit here is called the variable region. And it's this variable region that means that they are part of the specific immune response. This shape changes depending on the antibody. So, um, so this fits shape of antigen. But then there's also a region that doesn't vary, okay, the constant region. That's this whole part here. And the constant region has the same shape so that it can interact with other cells in the immune system. So it can signal, for example, to phagocytes, okay. And basically when that antibody binds onto a pathogen, it signals to the phag phagocyte, eat me, eat me, eat anything that I'm stuck to. All right, what about the structure? Well, we've got um, one, two, three, four polypeptide chains, okay? We've got two light chains. Can you see here is one light chain, and then here is the second light chain that I'm tracing there. And then we've got uh, a heavy chain, And again, there's two of those. There's this one here, and there's one here. Uh, and they're all held together, uh, well, the structure is, sorry, stabilized via these interactions here, disulfide bridges. And you can see there's quite a lot of them. In this special part here, we've got a slightly flexible version of the protein uh, so this is the hinge region. So um, an antibody is a bit like this, okay? It has two places where it can bind. It can bind at the tips of my fingers there, it can bind at the tips of the fingers there. And this hinge region means it can sort of flex a bit in between those two binding sites. So maybe this can bind straight up and this one can kind of twist this way and bind to the left. Or you know, they can bind very widely or quite narrowly. So that helps the binding ability. So um, this bit, signal to phagocytes, this bottom bit here can signal to phagocytes. So phagocytes actually contain a receptor on their cell surface membrane that actually binds to and interacts with this bottom part uh, of, the, of these heavy chains in the constant region. And that is called, the key word, opsonization. Okay, basically, it makes whatever the antibody sticks to, it makes it more attractive for a phagocyte to eat. So that's opsonization. The antibody acts as an opsonin. Other ways that antibodies work. Um, so how do they work? One, opsonization. Two, agglutination. Basically, that means sticking a load of 
uh, pathogens or a load of viruses together. If they stick them together in a big old clump, it means they're less able to go off and infect. And then actually what happens normally is you've got a big old clump of agglutinated viruses, let's say, that are also opsonized, and then a macrophage will come along and eat the whole clump together. And the third way is actually inactivation. Basically, if the antibody sticks onto a key important protein on the surface of the pathogen, then that pathogen won't be able to infect a cell, for example. So that's inactivation. Also, we should say that there is a class of antibodies that can also work as an antitoxin. Uh, so if an antibody doesn't bind the actual bacteria, let's say, but binds the toxin, it can inactivate the toxin. So, um, so inactivation brackets, let's write antitoxin. It's just a class of antibodies that binds to the toxins and not to the pathogens themselves. Okay, so now we're on to our very last little thing here. Um, when you first get an infection, it takes time before your antibody levels build up. And that's because, first of all, you've got your non-specific response kicking in. Then you start to get some antigen presentation going on. Those macrophages travel to the lymph nodes. Then they uh, find the right T helper cells and B cells to turn on to activate. Then you get the antibody response. So this can be you know, up to 10 days, two weeks after your initial um, infection. And then you get better, and then the levels of antibodies come down. That's because there are cells in the body called T regulator cells that bring down an immune response once it's no longer needed. However, afterwards, there are memory cells. There are T memory cells. Let's highlight those here. T memory cells. There are B memory cells. Cells that remember the pathogen. So that if you then get a second infection, the response is way bigger, okay? It's quick and it's massive, okay? You get a much, much bigger secondary response here. So let's talk about something that hopefully you've been vaccinated against, um, for example, BCG, okay? You might have had the tuberculosis vaccination, BCG, or the measles vaccination. So you might have had the measles vaccination last time when you were just a few years old. And there will still be B memory cells and T memory cells that remember that vaccination traveling in your body right now so that if you were to be infected with a, a measles virus, your body would respond so quickly that you probably wouldn't even know that you had a measles virus in you and you would not get sick. That's how vaccination works. Uh, so vaccination tries to trigger a secondary response um, without actually without actually you getting sick for the first time. OK, so. Vaccination, let's talk about here, um, tries to trigger a secondary, that's the symbol for secondary, second with a little circle, secondary response. Um, and I kind of don't want to go into too much detail about this because uh, this is quite a long video as it is. Um, but you could add a bit more detail about this. There are different types of vaccine. Um, so, you know, we can have live live viruses that are just slightly weakened. We can have attenuated, which is a fancy way for saying weakened. We can have dead vaccines that are just uh, a virus that's been killed chemically. Or we can just have component vaccines, um, which are just the antigens and none of the actual stuff on the inside of the virus particle. Live viruses tend to produce stronger immunity and more longer lasting, but um, they can be difficult for people who are, who are elderly or have weakened immune systems to take, so they might not be safe for all people. So those are some different types of vaccination um, we look at. Now, um, secondary response could have sort of leads to immunity because it's so fast, okay? If it's so fast, when you get the virus in you, let's say, your body doesn't, you know, you don't even get sick because you just kill it rapidly. So there are different types of immunity. Um, just to finish with this little 
table, you've got natural, you've got uh, artificial, we've got active, we got passive. Whoops, what am I doing? Okay. Active natural, that is get sick, get immune, okay? You got sick, then you get better, you're immune, you can do the secondary response. Active artificial, vaccination. You didn't get sick the first time, Artificially, you've been given a dead or weakened virus, and now you can actively produce the antibodies for yourself. Passive is you don't produce antibodies, okay? So natural passive is uh, babies get antibodies, I'll just write AB, from breast milk, okay? And they get antibodies in that breast milk, which protect them from the typical viruses and pathogens that are around that the mother's body already produces antibodies against. Artificial passive would be an anti, uh, anti-toxin injection. So you get an injection of antibodies to neutralize some toxin. And this is typical for things like anti-venom, so if you get bitten by a poisonous snake, we've got we've produced antibodies, I think often in horses, um, which will basically can be purified out of horse blood um, and given as an injection to counteract the toxin. It will bind to the toxin, neutralize it um, and stop it from having its uh, sort of negative effects. All right. OK, so that's everything. Um, now, we didn't cover everything in full, full detail, so you might want to add more de more detail to this. Um, there are different strategies for um, vaccinating, such as ring vaccination, um, for example, and controlling epidemics. So we could add, you could add more detail on that, looking at your textbook page on vaccination. We didn't really touch on the development of use, the development and use of drugs, other than that little bit about antibiotics. Right, okay, so that's almost all the syllabus covered. As I said, I don't think I'm going to do a mind map on the final topic, which was on uh, biodiversity and classification and evolution. I might change my mind on that, but I think the next activity I'll get for you to do are some multiple choice questions on this, and then we're going to go into some uh, past papers. So well done for reaching the final mind map. Uh, thanks very much for being so awesome uh, and sending me pictures of your beautiful, beautiful work. Uh, and I'll see you next lesson for the multiple choice. Thanks.